Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 76. Put the problem into the work. This vlog comes via request from Ritish. Ritish heard me use this phrase, put the problem into the work, in a video I recorded with Nat and Sunny. That video had one of our more memorable titles, You Can't Plan for Crazy. And in You Can't Plan for Crazy, I used the phrase, put the problem into the work. And Ritish asked me what I meant by that phrase. So I'm going to explain it in the vlog this week. But I can also hear Oh yes I can. All my former PhD students around the world groaning when I mentioned the phrase put the problem into the work because I pretty well destroyed their lives when I used this strategy with them. So let me explain what's going on here. Put the problem into the work is a technique, an andragogical technique to help students overcome a particular barrier or issue in their supervision. So say, for example, and this may be some of you right now, you're feeling very stuck in your writing or you're in the middle of the chapter and things are not quite settling, it's not quite working or an experiment happens and it's an absolute disaster. You go and do some field work and you're just not getting the outcomes or the results that you want. Does any of that sound familiar? Mm-hmm. So you have one of those moments in your research where you panic, you freak out, you think, what exactly is going on here? What exactly am I doing in this PhD? Now, let me just state every single PhD and indeed every single piece of research that you do will have these moments. The nature of research is that unexpected stuff happens. That's the point. So, you know, wow, that was unexpected, or gee, that argument didn't quite go where I wanted it to go, or uh-oh, a brand new article or book has emerged that has completely trashed the, the argument that I was trying to make. So the question then is, if bad stuff happens in your PhD, what are you going to do next? Okay. Now, as a supervisor, let me explain what this looks like from my perspective. So we have our weekly meetings with my student and in comes a student or up on the screen via Skype and the student is desolate, agitated, fearful, perhaps teary, perhaps crying, in panics, in a panic state. And the student comes in and they use some sort of phrase like, my thesis is not going to work. I'm stuck. Something really bad happened this week or I'm out, this PhD is over, that's always my personal favourite, I'm out, this PhD is over, or what the hell is happening in my research. So it's that sort of start of the meeting, these sorts of moments. So those expressions are coming from panic, from desolation, from fear. And so enters my phrase, my trope, my theory, my technique, put the problem into the work. So there are a lot of functions and meanings of that phrase that we're going to play with today. So let's go through the process and maybe this is you today, right now, this moment, or maybe it's you next week. Something very bad and unexpected happens in your research and your panic. You don't know what to do next. Well let me help you and show you what you can do next. So once a student tells me that everything has gone south, so south, we're in Antarctica, I then ask them to turn on the microphone of their mobile phone or I pull out my Zoom microphone and we record what's about to happen. I'll explain why we record it in a second. But I record the students going through the following process. I ask them, what has happened this week? What's triggered the panic? What's triggered the fear? So something has gone feral in the field work, okay. The analysis didn't match the expectations of the argument. Something bonkers happened in the lab, or indeed, and this is the crucial bit that often happens, a new bit of research has emerged internationally that directly contradicts the argument that the student is making. That's quite common. So I get the students to explain this situation to me in full texture and context and resonance and pain and passion. So I want to know what, what has happened. 
So firstly, the moment that you put the problem into language, you render it manageable. Because mostly when students start this, you know, my life is over, my thesis is over, they're sort of starting like, so it's panic. So we can't do much with the, but once it gets into language, it starts to become a little bit more controllable and manageable. So we understand the situation. We understand what is occurring. Put the problem into the work, put the problem into language. Okay, and that renders it not spooky, not a black box. This is a thing, this is a problem that we need to talk about. Okay, so that's the first stage. The second stage is when we provide the solutions. So what it does is it recognises that the flaws, the missteps, the errors, the confusions, that's actually part of the research. And further, those errors, missteps and confusions can and frequently do make the research and they certainly make it better. So I ask students in language, verbally, to tell me what they think the consequences are of this problem, this challenge, this issue, the consequences and problems of that on their PhD. So I get them to make the connection between the problem that has emerged and their research, their PhD. Build that bridge for me. What is this issue doing to the PhD? Talk through the bridge for me. So this stage allows students to do a few things. Firstly, it allows them to put this new development issue problem into context. So what actually is going on, put context around it, and then to enfold it back into their thesis and fold it back into the research that they're actually doing. So remember, if this helps you, the point of research, the point of research is managing the surprises. That's what research is, managing the surprises. Unexpected research outcomes, they're not problematic, they're a gift. When something weird happens in your research, it's brilliant, it's a gift, it's challenging, it's provocative. Because if everything is predictable, then that's not research. That's an episode of Bold and the Beautiful. So once we've assessed what has occurred and we've placed it into the context of their research, we then move to the final stage. And yes, we put the problem into the work. So what I do is I send students away with the recording and I ask them to write up the problem. So from the sonic, put it into words, put it into writing. So I ask them to write up the conversation, put it into narrative if they like, and then send me that written piece of work. So what we do in the following week is then we work with that written document and discover a way that maybe that can exist in the thesis. And quite frequently that written document in some form ends up in the thesis and improves it radically. So it may be in the literature review. If a disruptive article or book has emerged, then bang, that slice goes straight into the literature review and strengthens it. It might go into the methods. If something weird has happened in the lab or weird has happened with the equipment, it actually enhances the methods chapter. Or it goes into the analysis if something bizarre has happened in the field work. So this disruptive moment of your thesis could, and in almost all cases will, improve your PhD. So what I'm suggesting to you is that you go with the disruption. You go with the grain of the wood. You swim with the tide for me. So instead of endlessly trying to swim against the tide and actually getting nowhere, how about you just let the tide take you somewhere and you see where it's going and you sit in it for a moment and you'll be amazed what occurs. So write that up as a self-standing piece. What happened? Put the problem into the work and then work out where it might go in the thesis. And every single time you will surprise yourself. So 
For some people going through this process, the writing itself is incredibly difficult. And some students, and indeed some academics, refer to this as a writing block. Now, I don't believe in a writing block. I think it's like, it's like fairies, it's like dragons, it's like wizards. It's an imaginary thing. So I don't believe in a writing block. But if you are having some challenges writing, then put that problem into the work. So for example, say the words are not coming out as freely as you would like. Then tell me why. Why at this particular point of your research career are you having challenges writing this work down? Tell me about the block. Pick that scab. Tell me what is occurring. What does the block look like? Why is it happening now? Why at this point of your PhD? Write through the, the block. Tell me about the block and you will break it. I promise you. So ask yourself why you're having trouble writing about a particular concept or idea or result and you'll tell me something about that result. It'll be evocative and resonant and powerful. So putting the problem into the work has improved every single PhD I have supervised. It also ensures that the students finish quickly. All my students have finished quickly, and they finish quickly because they've put the problem into the work. They haven't sat in the problem and gone, oh, my thesis is over, my life is over, and they lose a day, a week, a month, a year, because they get stuck in the problem. I get into that problem, and we solve the problem, and we unfold it back into the thesis. We keep moving. Momentum in the doctoral space is incredibly important. So we get inside the problem, we learn from the problem, we put the problem into the thesis, and we improve the thesis. So this is a great strategy today if you are feeling overwhelmed or fearful or think that your thesis is slipping away. I do understand that feeling. And writing can be incredibly confronting at that stage. And that's why I record the conversation first. I get you to talk through the problem. And then secondly, we write about it. So talk it through first in all its texture and messiness and fear and emotion. Talk through it and then write from what you hear. So this is advice that I not only use in supervision but in my research life more generally and it's a lesson that I learn every single day myself. As I always say, a teacher is a learner with delusions of grandeur. So we must keep learning every single day. And I wanted to finish off with one more technique in this area that may actually help you do what you do every day. Now, I've written a lot of books <laughs> and I've written a lot of articles. And I've been really lucky because a lot of those books and articles have been well received. And I'm just really thankful that I've managed to gain a writing research career. I'm very thankful every single day. And it is a privilege. But on two occasions in my career, unbelievably, my books have been reviewed as the Times Higher Education Book of the Week twice in my career. It's just unbelievable. And those books are Thinking Popular Culture and also, bless, very precious book to me, Digital Dieting. So amazing that one person could have two books like that. It's unbelievable. But Thinking Pop, this one, Thinking Popular Culture, was reviewed by an absolute hero of mine, Fred Inglis, Professor Fred Inglis, who's the Emeritus Professor of Cultural Studies at Sheffield University. Fred changed knowledge. He's an absolute icon, absolute hero of mine. Not many people can say that their career changed knowledge, but Fred certainly did. And the idea that Fred Inglis, wow, reviewed one of my books was just breathtaking to me. And after the review appeared, I contacted him and we engaged in this wonderful correspondence. He was just a really decent, and he is a really decent, ethical, wonderful man. And he offered me a bit of advice that I will never forget. And from that day forward, after he offered me that advice, it changed how I write, changed my research, improved me as an academic. And this is pretty amazing if you think about it, because thinking popular culture, I was already a professor when I wrote it. It's the 13th book I ever published. So you think I would have worked it out by then. But anyway, and he said to me, look, you know, I love how you write. I love the staccato style. I'm known for a particular style of writing. And I love how you slam together ideas that no one ever thought about, slam together different disciplines. I love you doing that. But Tara, what I want you to do 
and I want you to keep making those connections, but he said to me, what I want you to do is start to make the argument rather than assume the argument. Make the argument rather than assume the argument. And I said to him, Fred, what do you mean by that, mate? What do you mean? And he said, Tara, you have a tendency to, you make the jumps, you make the leaps, you make the connections, and you assume that your audience is going to follow you there. But I don't want you to assume anymore. I want you to make the argument, not assume the argument. Brilliant. Changed my life from that point forward. Because all of a sudden I started to really take the time take a breath, stretch, and make the case rather than assume the case. And probably the best book I'll ever write, although I'm quite fond of the Trump book I'm writing at the moment, but probably the best book I will ever write, the book that I think is my best one, is Digital Dieting, which I think appeared about three books after this one. And why it was so strong, and why I'm so proud of it, is I made the argument rather than assumed the argument. So Fred was right. So all my scholarship improved from that single bit of advice. So in your own work this week, just check that you are making the argument rather than assuming the argument in your PhD. And I wish you a wonderful week writing through those problems. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.